take a girl and a guy, and they fall madly in love and form a family. Sprinkle in some counseling degrees and a doctorate, a dream of transforming relationships as we know it. And 20 years later, we give you power couple Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. And this is their podcast, Couples Synergy. Welcome back to another episode of Couples Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean. I'm Dr. Ray. And I'm Jean. And this is our podcast about love, marriage, and relationships. Be sure to check us out online on our Facebook page, Couples Synergy, or our website, couplesynergy.com. We also have an Instagram called Couple Synergy. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast or send us any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear more about. And now on to Couple Synergy, an in-depth look at love, marriage, and relationships, where we bring you our experiences working with thousands of couples for nearly 20 years. You know, everyone says you need to work on a relationship, but nobody teaches us how. So we've created this podcast to teach people what they can do to create the relationship they've always dreamed of with the partner they fell in love with. In this episode, we're going to be talking about blue flags. Now, in past podcasts... Episode 8, we talked about yellow flags. Right. And episode 23, we talked about red flags. Right. So yellow flags are caution. Red flags are toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. What are blue flags? A dying relationship. So before we get into that, I wanted to read off an awesome review we got on our podcast. Thank you for those reviews. They're really fun to get. It's it's really great feedback for us, and it kind of really helps us uh, figure out, you know, the next content we're going to create. Um, this review is from Jefferson underscore seventy nine, and he entitles this: "This is a must for couples." As a married man, I am always striving to strengthen the relationship between me and my wife. I fight daily to make our bond stronger. The things discussed in this podcast will help you to have the relationship of your dreams. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for that. (laughs) Jefferson 79. Thank you. And we also wanted to let you know about a suggestion that someone emailed us, a topic suggestion, and that would be parents who are struggling with a kid with special needs, right? Whether it be a learning disability or even medical issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, but just the challenges that that brings to their yeah, relationship. More uh, ideas for parenting when right. you're dealing with a challenging right. situation. Right. So, you know, if you are a parent out there that you are, you know, you've been struggling with some issues like that um, and you're willing to be on our podcast, please email us at contact at couplesynergy.com um, and we'd love to have you on. You're going to read an excerpt mm-hmm. from our upcoming book, right? On the blue flags? Let's start there. Yeah, let's start there. Let's okay. kind of describe blue flags mm-hmm. uh, so that everybody can kind of get that concept in their mind, and then we'll we'll talk more about it, you know, more in detail. But um, as we said, blue flags signify a dying relationship, and there, it's kind of like a code blue in the hospital, right? It indicates that the, the habits you form in your relationship are poisoning your connection and that the relationship is dying, right? So... There are specific blue flag issues that we have listed here, um, and they are keeping secrets, not sharing your whereabouts, not sharing passwords, or allowing your partner access to your phone, email, social media, or finances, living in a sexless marriage, tracking your partner, and getting your emotional needs met by someone outside of your primary relationship. And this could be like a parent or even one of your children or friends, whether they be same gender or opposite gender friends. seems like there's three categories. There's the kind that's hiding things, the kind that is not investing in things, and then the kind where you're taking your energy outside of the relationship. And usually this is something that has been going on for a very long time Mm -hmm. in the relationship. It's become the new norm. So we say in our book, it is not uncommon for people to be unaware of blue flag issues, especially if they pattern their relationship after their parents or their peers who have normalized these destructive behaviors. Right. And so sometimes I think people are very accepting of blue flag issues because they don't, they think it's insecure if they don't just accept it or even that they're encroaching on their partner's privacy. 
you know, but I, I think that is the point of being in a relationship is you are there to be a witness for your partner. And if there's things that they don't want you to know, it's probably things they shouldn't be doing. You know, I, I think initially it's justifiable, especially if someone is afraid of being controlled in their relationship, mm -hmm. you know, that they should be able to have their own privacy, that they should be able to, you know, look at their email, not have to seek permission, quote unquote, you know, from their partner. But if you're already thinking in that manner, then there's a problem in the relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gradual, right? In a relationship where you start out and you start sharing and then you share more and you share more. So we're not talking about a new relationship. We're talking about a well-established married couple. Right, or, or just a, a couple that's a well been together couple. for, you know, a long time. Right. So let, let's tackle you know, the first one, let's just kind of go in order and kind of talk a little bit more in detail. The first one is keeping secrets. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty self self explanatory. Yeah. You know, if you have to hide something from your partner or keep something from them, then there is obviously a huge gap in the relationship already. You know, one of the things that is tricky is if you have a job that requires you to not share, right? Like our work, right? We can't, well, we can talk about it because we work together, but if someone's a therapist and their partner isn't, they can't discuss that. Right. Or other things. I think that's very challenging. Yeah, good friends of ours, um, you know, they work for the government mm -hmm. and they have to keep what they do in their branch of government a secret from their partner. Right. And our couple on Thursday, they're both law enforcement. Right, exactly. And in many cases, you know, having to keep that information from your partner because it's part of your career, it just adds a level of complication uh, in your communication together. You know, the things that we keep secrets are usually things that we feel shame of. And that's what shame makes us do is, is hold that inside and keep a secret, our insecurities or um, things we feel like we made mistakes with. And so the, the secrets that you're not sharing with your partner are really great opportunities for you not only to become closer to your partner, but to heal something within yourself. And we start to keep secrets from our partner when we get more and more invested in the relationship, when there's more at risk, right? We are afraid of being rejected. We're afraid that our partner is going to judge us and that they're going to leave us. You know, if they truly know who we are, you know, a flawed human being. Do you think that by sharing our flawedness, if that's a word, it allows us to be better people because we have that accountability. We have that reflection. And so then I think it calls you to be better, right? It's like when we diet together, we don't cheat. But if I was dieting by myself, I might. <laughs> because we hold each other accountable more, right? you know, when we're doing it together. And, and I think in the beginning, if you are sharing your mistakes and your flaws with your partner, then you know, you give this best opportunity for the two of you to help each other become better versions of yourselves. Yeah. The, uh, the second one is not sharing your whereabouts. And so obviously if you start keeping secrets, right, then it will translate to not sharing your whereabouts. You know, a funny thing that just came to mind here is we had talked about in the, another podcast about how you start your relationship off with a lie because you have to buy a engagement ring and you have to keep it away from your partner <laughs> and then you have to go talk to their you know their parents like traditionally right yeah, and uh -huh. you have to be on the sly all about it right <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think we're not talking about those kinds of secrets here right right, right. Uh, but not sharing your whereabouts you know that is that's a big big flag that, that actually is very unsettling for the other person and this is true if you live in the same house with another human being, right? It doesn't even matter if it's, you know, just directly your partner. That's like amplified of that. But even if you have adult kids that live with you and you don't know where they are, it's just unsettling. Yeah, you know, you wouldn't do that with a roommate. Right. Like if you had a roommate, you would let them know that you're going somewhere just just from a safety perspective. Right. Right. But we get couples that never know where their partner is. Yeah. I mean, that's really scary. And sad. It, you know, if this is your person, 
you would think you'd want to share that. You think you would want them to know who you are and what you're doing and who you're with. Uh, not sharing passwords or allowing your partner access to your phone, email, social media, or finances. It's a really big one. It's huge. Yeah. You know, I think if you've been burned in a relationship before, if it if it was more along the lines of the red flags and toxicness, then these things are going to be difficult. Yeah, because right? you're going to want to protect yourself mm-hmm. and you're not going to want to open up right away. Right. There was a couple we were working with and he was very, very secretive about everything, where he was, money, everything. And then they went through a divorce. He was cheating on her and she got into a new relationship and about a month in, he was taking a shower and she went and looked on his phone. She just looked through his phone and then she came in for a session and I said, you know, you need to go and tell him what you're feeling and and what you did and, and how, you know this is is making you feel and it was really awesome because she did that and she went back and she's like look i checked your phone i had someone lying to me in a previous relationship and he goes you know what let's look at it together i have nothing to hide from you and i want you to feel secure in this relationship and he became an open book which really helped her heal something and that is absolutely ideal Mm -hmm. right when couples are able to help each other heal from past wounds from past relationships. But when you start creating this veil of secrecy, then it it creates more divisiveness. It creates more suspicion. It creates more doubt in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've met a couple who is open about their social media and their emails. Um, I'm going to say that backwards. I don't think we've met a couple that's been secretive about that stuff that we're, that we're doing good things behind the other person's back. Like it was not just, I want my privacy. It was because they were doing something. Right. I mean, if, if you can't show your partner what you are viewing on your phone or, or in your email or social media and you can't show them your finances, then there's something that you're trying to hide. Yeah. And you know, with finances, we're not, saying how you should manage your finances but you and your partner should have a clear understanding of where each other is and what your plans are because you're each other's person you know I, I think this area of finances needs a little bit more clarification because you know it is understandable if someone is coming into a relationship they already have a an established career they already have been managing their own finances by themselves and then their partner Likewise, has an established career and they've been managing their finances by themselves. A lot of couples these days, they keep separate finances. Especially if they have children from past relationships. Right, mm-hmm. right. And, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of times we run into couples where one person doesn't know what the other person is doing in their finances, but they just kind of join together. They pay bills together, you know, and... In that way, they, they kind of just share that information when it is needed. Mm-hmm. I think this is very different than someone who is hiding hiding it, has a, a an offshore bank account, right, right, and is, is stashing away money or is spending money in places that they don't want their spouse to know about. Yeah, yep. And you know, if you are in a red flag toxic relationship and you're trying to put money aside so that you can leave that is not what we are talking about we are talking about if you are in a committed relationship with someone that you love and you want to be closer to that you should you know open yourself up and share a little bit more so that you guys have a a more forging in that area because finances are a foundation of life and in another podcast we talked about a common vision right and a common vision is very important for couples this includes a financial common vision. Right. Like if both of you want to retire somewhere on a beach, right? Or on a mountaintop. Or take a vacation. Or take a vacation, you have to have a common vision, including your finances. Right. So the next one is a really big one, um, and that is living in a sexless marriage. Right? That's a really big one. And we see it way too often. Yeah. The couple's coming through our door. Um, Newsweek magazine actually estimated that 15 to 20 percent of couples are in a sexless mar- marriage or sexless sexless relationship. I believe it. 
And, you know, there are some definitions out there say that's less than 10 times a year. Um, we kind of look at it as four times or less a year. Yeah. Um, and that, that is something that just, it, it's just heartbreaking when you see a couple come in and they're just, they are not connecting in, in that place at all. You know, this is a blue flag because the secrecy of the other topics we've talked about on this podcast lead to a lack of vulnerability that's necessary in order to have physical intimacy as well, right? And even if you're a person that maybe has some type of physical problem where you're not capable of having sex, you should still be able to be affectionate. And what we see when they break down sexually is they also stop touching each other at all. Mm -hmm. And so we're, what we're talking about is not just intercourse, but all forms of affection. When you think about it, when you start creating that divide and space between you and your partner, you start hiding parts of who you are. You don't want to share at the most intimate of levels. Right. Right. The closest that we could ever be to another human being is having sex with them. And, you know, that's physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, mentally as well. And so that is definitely going to take a back seat because you are putting your energy in other places. Yeah, I would say about 25% of the couples that we work with don't sleep in the same bed, which is a horrible habit to start. Mm -hmm. You know, I know some people have, they all say it's snoring, but you know, you can get used to someone snoring and learn to sleep through or, that. Or it's little kids, mm -hmm. you know, little yep. kids can't sleep yep. through the night. They come in and, you know, they want to sleep with one of the parents. Right. And so parents start, you know, splitting their time, you know, one sleeping in the bed of one child and one sleeping in the bed of another child. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the, the last topic on this, right? Right. Which is, yeah. But, um, you know, if you are in a sexless relationship, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say there's probably a big wound because naturally we are designed to want that, um, that intimacy and that connection, that closeness with another human being. And typically that only breaks down when someone's hurt another human being in that way. Whether it is your current partner that has caused the wound or whether you are bringing a wound from your past relationships into your current relationship, I would agree. It is definitely a wound, you know, that the relationship has an opportunity now to heal. Mm -hmm. You know, even our sexless couples or couples that don't sleep in the same bed. And when we teach them, you know, the four most important times a day, you know, the four minute cuddle first thing in the morning, uh, hello and goodbye ritual. And then the last four minutes of the day, they have a hard time even having that level of intimacy or affection. That's all non-sexual affection. And it always brings something up that really needs to be healed. And you can heal it. That's why we develop couples energy to teach people how to do that. Yeah, you really want to think along the lines that this is a dying relationship. It's just, it's withering on the vine. Yeah. Because it's not being fed. It's not being nurtured. And now you have these other behaviors here that is adding to the distance between the two people in the relationship. You know, our natural thing to do when we are in a fight with our partner is to create distance. Like right? physical distance. Physical distance. I mean, you can tell when you walk into a room and you see a couple that are in a fight, mm -hmm. right? They, you feel that tension. You feel that distance that they're creating because you're doing that to protect yourself because you were just hurt. Yeah, I know, I know that's a really big challenge when you and I get in a fight. <laughs> what? We never fight. What are you talking about? And... I, sometimes I just really have to have this internal battle with myself to, you know, in the morning after things have settled down to try and push myself to go cuddle you. And it's just amazing how much comfort that is mm -hmm. after you've been fighting to feel that connection again, even though we haven't even talked about it or resolved anything. But just it's like it's like you feel like everything's OK again, you know, and I mm -hmm. think your your um, fight or flight response just simmers all the way down, even if you don't like it, and if I'm touching you. <laughs> <laughs> I still get you the coffee, though. Right. In the morning. <laughs> well, because, you know, 
for all you that out there, she's a Scorpio, so she's a runner. Yep. And the Scorpios, the, the Scorpions got to run back into their little den. Under my rock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, having fights and having conflict is natural and normal in a relationship. But if you are creating this distance in your relationship and you're not feeding it, you're not investing it, you have all of these blue flags, you have no chance in really repairing anything. Yeah. So, you know, if you can, push yourself to get back in the bedroom together and at least trying to have a little bit of affection. It's good for your health and it's really good for your relationship. This next one is a really scary one, right? It's, it's tracking your partner. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot more of that now because mm-hmm. of technology, mm-hmm. right? We've had several couples where one person is, you know, putting tracking devices on, you know, their car, or, on their partner's car or, or finding them through their phone and they're a block away from where they said they were going because they stopped at the gas station and they're not at Target yet and they're calling them like, where are you? Why aren't you where you said you were going to be? And we're seeing like not only tracking your partner, but tracking your kids as well. Yeah. Right. So they have these these family apps now where you can see where your kids are at at all times. And, you know, it's very justifiable to say that I just want to make sure my kids are where they say they're going to be and that they're not lying to me and that they're safe and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then they start using the app for other reasons. Right. You know, I remember a time as a child and you'd be behind closed doors and maybe you're cleaning your room or something and there's a song on and you just sort of dance and you're silly and then someone opens the door and you feel very embarrassed. Right. Yeah. So when we're being watched, it changes who we are as human beings. And we start watching our babies at the moment of their birth and we track them and then our partners throughout their lives. And I think it really changes who we are. And I think we have to escape somewhere else because it's natural for us to crave that solitude so that we can really create and become and know ourselves. But if someone is always observing us, it's always going to be their vision of us that we are trying to break, break free from. It was actually a part of a study that I, was, that I actually was a lead for in college about being observed and how that changes our behavior, right? When we know someone is watching us or someone is looking at us, then our behavior, our choices are not as genuine or authentic. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because I think it brings some level of something to the person observing and it takes something away from the person being observed. And I would highly recommend that instead of tracking the people you're in relationships with, whether it's your partner or your child, that you try having a real relationship with them. You know, most of us that are in our 40s or older grew up without all this technology and our parents had no idea where we were and I remember hearing this story where there was a a bus accident so these kids were on a school bus and they all had phones and the parents were all aware that their kids were in this bus accident but it didn't make them be able to keep their kids safe no it just made them aware sure and so it's not a form of safety at all Not to mention it doesn't do anything for trust or building trust in a relationship. Right. If you know where your partner is at all the time because you're watching them or you're having to track them, it gives no opportunity in the relationship for them to be able to prove that they are being honest and being truthful, you know, because they want to be, not because they have to be. And if you're the person doing the tracking it's not ever going to make you feel any more secure in this relationship. We only feel secure when we trust ourselves and then we respond appropriately to what our partner is doing. And if they really are doing something that's inappropriate, you have a different choice to make. Right. But if, if you're wearing it down, that's what is it you say? You can't prove innocence, right? That's why we are innocent until proven guilty. You can only prove guilt. The last one is getting your emotional needs met by someone outside of your primary relationship. And we include in there parents, children, or friends, 
whether it be a same gender or opposite gender friend, this is where you are, you are taking your energy that should be going to your primary relationship, your partner, and you are expending that energy elsewhere. If there are other people that know more about your relationship than your partner does, that is a blue flag. Yeah, it's a really big problem, right? I remember this one couple we were working with and, you know, when I'm working with someone, I have them bring me a list of resentments. And she comes in and she's reading her resentments and she gets all the way done with it. And she says, you know, my husband doesn't know any of these, but my mom knows all of them. And she realized how much her mom had influenced her to try to protect herself from her partner, but it was actually destroying her marriage. Her mom's insecurities were destroying her marriage. Well, you think about it. You don't give your partner an opportunity to, to be your person, mm-hmm. right? The person that you can run to that will be there for you, that will support you through any challenges you're going through. If you are turning to other people for that, then that creates even more distance between you and your partner because they're just, they're not invested. They are not part of your life. You know, the rule of thumb should be if you're the one that has to wake up next to someone or not wake up next to someone, then you're really the only one that can be influencing a decision about these things that would impact something like that. Someone else can have opinions about your relationship, but they don't have to live with the consequence of their opinion. You do. You, you probably would be surprised when we say a child. Right. Right, and how a child fits into this blue flag. Um, too often, we run into cases where parents are, uh, the word is espousing their child. Yeah. Their child becomes almost like their, their partner, right? They start to treat them almost like an equal or like an, another adult. And you know, it's so damaging to your kids because they like it when they're 15, 16, 17 years old and you're making them your confidant, but you're destroying their ability to ever trust someone of the opposite gender or even if it's same gender because they know that you you are going outside of that relationship and giving them information that actually is hurtful to them. It also puts them in a position of having to be more of the adult in the situation to take responsibility for the struggles that you are having or the pain that you're feeling, it almost makes them grow up faster than they really should. Right. And it it turns them against their other parent, which is very damaging. It elevates them to the same level and the other parent can't properly parent them then. When children are younger, people tend to go to their children for physical affection instead of their partner. Hugging them, you know, holding them at night when they're falling asleep. Sleeping with them. Right. And this, you know, typically happens if a partner has to work odd hours Mm -hmm. or, you know, late hours, things like that, where they're not able to be around. And you naturally want to give affection to your child. But when you start giving more affection to your child than you are giving your primary relationship, things become out of balance. I like to think about it like if you are giving affection to your child because you need it, then it's not appropriate. If you're giving it to them because they need it, then it's appropriate. And, you know, when we're talking about sleeping with your children, we're talking about kids over the age of three. Mm -hmm. You know, under the age of three, those are, you know, kind of... Bonding moments. Yep. Yep. But really anything over 12 months old you are going to start a pattern that you are then going to have to break. And it will be very painful for your child to break that pattern of sleeping with you because you're giving them that idea that the world is scary if they're on their own. And so they're not learning really important things like delaying gratification and self-soothing and problem solving independently and tolerating negative emotions and all those things that are really good emotional regulation things because they believe the world's a scary place. Because you are teaching them they can't be alone. The last case of turning to friends in order to get your emotional needs met can be a very slippery slope. And this would lead to 
red flags, right? Where there could be some potential boundary crossings. Right. And, you know, everyone out there may have a friend that they turn to, that they talk to about the things that they're going through in life, especially the challenging times. But what we're talking about here is when things become so out of balance that, again, that friend becomes your person, where you are communicating to them more intimate and personal things than you do your partner. Kind of reminds me of, you know, when people play video games and then they get a cheat code, (laughs) you know, where you can put the code in and then it, it moves you through the difficult stuff but you didn't learn the necessary skills that you need actually to be at the next level. And your partner is going to challenge you to dive deep and actually heal whatever the thing is that you're talking about with other people, but other people are not. Other people can support you. They're only hearing your version of it. There is, there is a source of comfort in that, but it's a cheat code. It's not doing it authentically and it's not helping you grow and become as a person as opposed to dealing with it with your actual partner. Especially if you're turning to a friend that doesn't have it down. Right. Like they're struggling through relationships. They haven't figured things out for themselves. And then now you guys are like the blind leading the blind. Especially if they've already divorced. They are going to be very invested in reaffirming their decision of ending their relationship. And it's not going to be because they're objective about yours. So of all of these blue flags, they're tough. They're tough to resuscitate your relationship and get back on the right track. But one thing we'd like to challenge people to do if you really do want to work on your relationship is increase that level of affection. That is something we all need as human beings. And it's, it's something that is immediately beneficial for both of you, even if you haven't resolved all your issues. You could also face this challenge that we're kind of presenting to you by sitting down with your partner and being transparent, you know, showing them your, your phone, your social media account, you know, and it doesn't have to be weird or anything. You could just say, Hey, take a look at this. This is what I'm, you know, this is what this person said, or this is what is going on. And so you kind of make it a mutual thing, you know, where it doesn't seem like it's going to be divisive. Yeah. I think that if you're in a room with another person and suddenly their attention is drawn away from you, it's really normal to go, what is it? You know, like what if you're talking to someone and a big red tail hawk flies by and you're, you're focused on that and you'd be like, hey, look, there's a red tail hawk. It's natural for us to share that. But when we are on our phones for some reason, we feel like that's an extension of us and we should protect it or hide it and not share. And, and I think that learning to share that actually is... It's really freeing, isn't it? Don't you think? Absolutely. Again, if you're needing to hide what you are seeing or what you're, who you're interacting with from your partner, then it's probably something you shouldn't be doing. And so for all of you listening, we really want to thank you again for joining us today and for listening to Couple Synergy. And we hope that by listening to this episode, it was not only beneficial for your life, but also your relationship. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave us a review on iTunes. We we read every single one. Uh, We read all of the emails that people send us to. This is is really an exciting project for us in, in doing our podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or topic suggestions, again, please email us at contact at couplesynergy.com. For more information about Couple Synergy and our programs, such as Relationship 101, the Couples Weekend Intensive, and our premier program called Couple to Couple, look us up online at couplesynergy.com. And if you try one of our challenges, we'd love to hear about it. And if you know someone who could benefit from this episode, please download it and share it. And thank you for listening. Until next time, synergize your life, synergize your love. You have been listening to Couple Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Couple Synergy was recorded, edited, and produced by Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Voiceover and music entitled Breathe and Let Go was recorded and composed by Gina Gonzalez.